U.S. officials estimate there are as many as 3,000 Westerners who have traveled to places like Iraq, Syria, and Yemen to fight alongside extremists, some seeking training so that they can carry out attacks at home. We have heard many stories from reformed terrorists on why they choose to pick up weapons and kill innocents. But rarely do we unearth the real reason for coming to their senses and leaving behind a life destined to end in death for everyone. Let's welcome to Midpoint a former jihadist and a former undercover counterterrorism agent for the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, Mubin Sheikh, joins us today. Mubin, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me, sir. Mubin, when did you get involved? When did you become a jihadist and why? Um, yeah, I grew up in Toronto, Canada. I wasn't discriminated against, uh, alienated, isolated. Uh, was made to feel guilty that I was living a, a, a party life. At the age of 19, I went to Pakistan. I had a uh, chance encounter with the Taliban. Um, I was bit by the jihadi bug, so to speak. And from basically 1995 to 2001, um, I engaged in extremist uh, rhetoric, uh, the supporting the global jihadist culture. Um, I had multiple chances to go to fight in Pakistan, Chechnya, India. Um, thank God, you know, my circumstances didn't permit me to go. Uh, but it was the 9-11 attacks that really made me rethink my commitment to the cause. And uh, after that, I went to Syria. I spent two years studying Arabic Islamic studies, um, debunking my in extremist interpretations, um, came back to Canada, became an undercover operative, to two years of uh, direct embedded undercover work with, uh, with extremist groups and individuals. Uh, culminating in a, in a major prosecution in 2006 in which 11 individuals were convicted. Mubin, what was the switch, though, that went off? Because when you're going through this, there has to be something. When you talk about it happened and you decided to go against it, you were indoctrinated. There had to be an awful lot of hate going on when you originally joined this these movements. So it still is going to be tough for people to understand why you suddenly came back to the good side, if you will. Right. If I can be simplistic, it, it really comes down to, to grievances and ideology and how the two interact with one another. Uh, for me, it was, uh, it was an identity crisis. Uh, it was a sense of adventure, um, uh, getting involved in this sort of stuff. And when we talk about grievances, it could be uh, I personally and directly did not have any grievances. But once I started to watch jihadi videos over and over and over and over, you develop what's called a vicarious deprivation so that the deprivation of other people that you're watching becomes your personal deprivation and suffering in france you know there, there's real deprivation discrimination um you know unemployment all sorts of problems that the, the um, minorities have in in france i didn't have that but i developed like i said vicarious deprivation but in other cases there's real deprivation but do you now ask yourself, do you go back over all this and think to yourself, how could I have been so naive? Because it seems as if you really didn't have a problem with anybody. You were, you were brainwashed in many ways. And certainly, you're an intelligent guy. You've got to think to yourself, how could I have been so stupid? Oh, yeah. Um, many, believe me, I've had many, many moments of that. And, um, and, and really, I think a lot of times now, I could very easily have been one of the many young kids that we're, we're talking about today, basically. Then let me ask with regard to these young kids. We're told by a lot of people, experts, that it's social. It's because they're unemployed. It's because they come from places where people don't like their skin color, their religion. But we keep going back to hearing that it's society's fault. It's the government's fault many times that a lot of these young men and women become radicalized. Do you fall for that? Um, well, you know, it, it, it depends. It's, there's like a lot of... Uh, in France, there are social issues. These, these are things that exacerbate the radicalization process. Um, it, it's never just one thing. It's a collection of things acting, uh, interacting with one another. Ideology, it plays a large part in this. It's not just deprivation or social issues, but it's also coming to take on extremist ideology, which calls, which calls for you know, killing non-Muslims, killing those who are not like you, wanting to impose, you know, the caliphate on the rest of the world. Well, let me uh, ask so you this, are, Mubin, are you Muslim? Yes, yes, Alhamdulillah, yes. Were you, born, were you uh, originally a Muslim or were you converted? 
you know, I was born and raised into a Muslim family. Um, I just got a lot extreme. My, my family's not extreme, thankfully, but uh, I did get uh, it did get into it a little bit too much. Then at any time while you were growing up as a kid, did you get a sense from your family or the people around you that to be Muslim meant that you had to be an extremist, that you had to follow what some believe is the teaching of Muhammad, which is much more than the eye for the eye, but to kill the infidel when given the chance? Well, that's the thing. First, there is no such teaching of that sort. And um, I, I was led to believe this, right, by, by selectively quoting verses, by looking at, you know, the situation, political situation that was going on in the world. My family, you know, I didn't get that from my family. I got that from, my, uh, from meeting the Taliban in 1995, just before they took over Afghanistan. They basically said to me, look, the only way to achieve change in the world is through jihad, and that's it. And it was just an unflinching, unyielding worldview. Were you trained to carry a gun or a weapon, and did you ever attack someone or perhaps attempt to kill someone? No, thankfully, I did not engage in any uh, violent acts. Uh, I fantasized about committing violent acts. I thought about um, attacking targets, um, you know, I, I, but I did not thankfully engage in any, any attacks. That's one of the reasons why uh, I was able to work with, uh, with the intelligence service. I've got about a minute or so left here. In Denmark, they are trying the rehabilitation of jihadists, extremists, involving counseling, readmission to school, meeting with parents, and other outreach efforts. You've been there. Is this something that works? Is rehabilitation possible? You know, it, you, you cannot change unless you want to change. Um, so forced rehabilitation does not work. Uh, it must be willful. But on top of that, you, there's also a concern, what about sleeper agents? Uh, people who will, who will say what you want to hear, answer the questions the way you want to hear, just so that they can not be arrested and charged, and then they can put, be put back in circulation to conduct further attacks. I only have about 15 seconds left. Is there any doubt in your experience whatsoever that there are currently sleeper agents in Canada and the United States simply waiting to strike? Very little doubt. I am I'm sure we already have returnees in Canada and the U.S. The U.S. has a very low number of individuals, but uh, you can see what just four individuals can do. So it's certainly not an imaginary threat. Ruben Sheikh, it's a fascinating story indeed. Welcome back to the real world. Thank you so much for sharing us with your experiences. We'll look forward to talking to you again. And Midpoint will continue.